This week on Behind the Lens, I'm joined by Peter Cairns. Peter's worked as a nature and conservation photographer in Scotland for over 20 years, co-founding major communications initiatives such as Tooth and Claw, Wild Wonders of Europe and 2020 Vision. He is a senior fellow of the International League of Conservation Photographers and until recently ran a successful photo tour business. His real passion is using visual imagery as a communications tool to inform and inspire. In 2016, he founded Scotland The Big Picture, a social enterprise that pushes forward the process of rewilding Scotland. We put the question to Pete, what are your three most memorable images? This image um, is probably about 12 years old now. Um, I remember it distinctly because I'd spent three weeks in Norway um, prior to taking this shot or, or similar shots to this trying to get pictures of Capercaillie to, to no avail. Spent three weeks every night in a hide in a, in a mountain and, and got nothing and came back sort of cursing and um, that I'd not got anything. And, and I was literally having a coffee with my wife and, and the phone rang. It was a forester friend of mine who, who had discovered a, a rogue Capercaillie, the, these birds that behave aggressively towards people, to, to pretty much towards anything. And, and it was almost too good to be true. And this was literally just a mile from, from where, where we sit now. So um, I dashed over there and sure enough, it was in the third tree on the left past the gate sort of thing um, and spent probably the best part of two years on and off photographing this one bird. Um, so it was, a, it was an ironic um, image from that point of view, the story that preceded it. I think what this image also suggests to me it was a little bit of a turning point because this was at the point when the internet was starting to play a real role in, in image um, display. And what happened with this bird is that one or two images started to creep out. That became five or six, that became a hundred. And literally within sort of a year, two years, everybody and their mother was descending on this one bird to take its picture. And so for me, that was a little bit of a turning point in as much that um, the, the sort of process of, of photography democratization, if you like, was all of a sudden manifest. And I just thought to myself, there's there's no merit or there's no pleasure even in me getting in that bun fight with everybody else. So it's really at the point of taking the series of images of this Capricola that I thought, I need to change my tack here. I need to find something that is not easily replicated, not easily doable, not easily achievable. But I think for me, this this bird represents that that tipping point when wildlife photography became a literally a mass participation sport and wherever there was a a blue chip opportunity the internet would see to it that everybody was made aware of it and everybody would descend on it and, and i kind of just thought mm, maybe this is the time to to do something a little bit different probably about i don't know five or six years ago i i kind of thought to myself what are the what are the species that are a not particularly well photographed b that i can tell a, a compelling conservation story about and see I suppose in, in in tandem with not easily photographed I suppose if I'm honest that was so that nobody would be easily be easily able to, to, to copy or to replicate so combining camera traps with difficult species um, you know it would it would really put a little bit of a barrier if you like against um, people just easily replicating this sort of stuff so golden eagle um, was a species I'd never photographed, uh, in this country at least. Um, so I worked with a, a local stalker up in uh, Assin, which is just north of Ullapool. He was culling red deer anyway as part of the conservation program up there, uh, aiding, aiming towards um, natural woodland regeneration. Um, and I had a, a, so this was a two, two, two and a half hour drive, sort of an hour walk across moorland, set up a camera trap, no idea whether the eagles would accept it, no idea whether the eagles would come down to the bait. Um, they did pretty quickly, to be fair, but the, the process was just fraught with all manner of technical issues. So, you know, mice chewing through cables, obviously battery power was an issue up there. It's very windy, it's very cold. Um, anything out of the north meant that the lens was covered in rain or snow or whatever. Um, I used to get the eagles in last light and first light, so the shutter speed meant that they were all ghosted. So I got a lot of activity really quickly, which gave me an enormous amount of hope. Um, but for the following sort of three months, I was just getting nearly shots. Um, and then eventually I got a series of this adult eagle, this female adult eagle, 
I say a series, she was only on the carcass for a matter of two or three minutes. Um, and this, this sort of heraldic wing spread, it, it kind of looks quite spectacular, but in actual fact, it's a reaction to the, to the click of the camera. She's heard the camera and she's, she's sort of recoiling at it. So although it adds a little bit of dynamism to the image, um, actually it's, it's indicative of the fact that the camera trap is in place. But perhaps more significantly, it, it really takes me along the journey of, of storytelling. And that's kind of what I'm into these days. And as you know, using the wide angle gives a much more sort of um, uh, holistic um, interpretation of the, it relates the subject to the environment. And what this does for me is says that, you know, eagles in the West Coast feed routinely on, on carrion. And that probably says something about the ability of the landscape over there to sustain live prey. Further east, where we are in the Cairngorms, they, they routinely hunt mountain hares, ptarmigan, etc., etc. Not so much on carrion. So the fact that the, the golden eagle's feeding on carrion actually, actually opens the door for a story to be told about the ecological degradation of the landscape in which they live. So it ticks a lot of boxes from that point of view. And, and it was just a huge thrill to get to get the image nailed eventually after probably six months of trying. Yeah, so third image, um, and, and I suppose by, I'd say by today's standards, this image is probably, I don't know, three years old, it's, it's nothing special. But what it represents to me, again, carrying on that journey is a, a pretty long and arduous, tortuous is probably the more the word, process in getting pine martins coming into a bit of local forest, just, just a matter of three minutes walk from here actually, um, getting them used to the camera, uh, working out the whole uh, issue with lighting, etc., etc., um, and building a relationship with those martins to a point that they would come in and be completely oblivious to the equipment that was set up in the forest, in their forest. These, these are not martins coming into somebody's garden. These are truly wild pie martins. Um, and getting it right ultimately. And uh, this was the first image that I that I really liked, the one that I thought, okay, I'm, I'm on something here, I've, I've kind of nailed it. You've never completely nailed it, but you know what I mean. So I was pleased with the kind of the spotlight effect and the woodland behind. And again, using a wide angle lens, which I've kind of, is my uh, go-to piece of equipment these days. Um, you know, you can you can include the environment and, and tell a little bit more of a story about Pie Martin. So I've got, you know, dozens of Pie Martin images along the, the same sort of lines um, now, but this was the one that really represented a little bit of a breakthrough in terms of Martins, in terms of camera trapping, and again, in, in, terms, of, in terms of the ability for, the, for, for this type of image that combines the subject with the environment in which it lives, um, its ability to, to open the door to tell stories. So I've been able to use, not specifically this image, but my sort of wider Pine Martin portfolio, if you like, um, to tell all manner of stories about Pine Martins themselves, about their comeback, but also about their relationship with the forest and the health of the forest. So um, from an ecological point of view, these types of images open up many, many more possibilities than just straight long lens portraits. So that's why I'm, from a storytelling point of view, that's why I'm particularly keen these days to use the techniques that are, whether it's camera trap or something else, that allow me to get a wide angle lens in. We're working on a project called Scotland the Big Picture and it's really using our photographic uh, resource um, combined with other media platforms. Filming of course is a lot more accessible these days. Drones are the currency of the day, time lapse etc. All these visual techniques if you like, these, visual, uh, these, these, these elements of, of uh, visual media to tell stories. It's as simple as that. Um, the subject matter with Scotland, the big picture, is about the whole process of rewilding, which is very contemporary, of course, in the conservation scene at the moment. So really what we're doing is using visual media to create um, books, films, magazine features, whatever, um, to promote or to amplify the case for a wilder Scotland. If you're interested, it's uh, 3Ws, scotlandbigpicture.com, Facebook, Twitter and Instagram and all the usual stuff um, you'll find us. So, yeah, come along and join the journey. Why not check out these other interviews here? Thanks for watching and don't forget to like, share and subscribe. Until next time, cheers.